Welcome to the Motivational Interviewing, Building a Foundation for Effective Patient Engagement in Team-Based Care Conference Call. My name is Danielle, and I will be your operator for today's talk. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Ashley Green. Ashley, you may begin. Thanks so much, Danielle. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar for motivational interviewing. Uh, again, my name is Ashley Green, and I am the Cardiac Health Improvement Project Specialist uh, for Metastar. And just a couple of uh, quick housekeeping uh, items to get through before I introduce our speaker today. Uh, the big thing, of course, is we're all looking forward to seeing you at Chula Vista next week for the uh, live workshop with Mia. I've um, been to a couple of these myself, and, and I can say that you're in for a real treat with Mia. It's uh, a real opportunity uh, for all of us to have her again speaking on this important topic. Now, as we go through the webinar today, um, everyone will be on mute, but you are welcome to put questions into chat, which uh, Mia and I will monitor along the way. And if we start to see certain themes develop or a sense of urgency, I'll probably break in and interrupt uh, Mia to address a question or two. But otherwise, uh, we'll try to address some of those uh, towards the end of Mia's webinar. And you'll also have the opportunity to uh, break in live and, and ask your question in, in person. So uh, with that, let me introduce Mia, who is an experienced mental health counselor and trainer and coach in motivational interviewing. Uh, she holds a master's degree from Valparaiso University in clinical mental health counseling, and she's a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, or MINT. Mia is currently the program manager for the Wisconsin Initiative to Promote Healthy Lifestyle at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health, Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. Mia, it's a pleasure to have you again today. Take it away. Thank you, Ashley, and uh, thank you all for joining us over your lunch hour. We've got you all on mute, so feel free to munch away on your lunches, and I promise I won't, so you won't hear any lunch crunching from me. Um, the intention of this introductory webinar is really just to get some of the basic information, some of the foundational concepts about motivational interviewing under our belt so that we can most efficiently use our face-to-face -face workshop time, really um, thinking together about how motivational interviewing might be useful in your work um, and getting our hands on these tools and strategies and having as much of a chance as possible to really try things out and practice them when we're in the room together. So um, there's not much I can do to make a webinar super jazzy and exciting, but we'll try and get, you know, some basic information under our belt um, on this call so that we can really hit the ground running um, next week when we're all together at Chula Vista, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so, you know, for the entire learning series, including um, the, web, the webinar today as well as the live workshop, and then we'll have a follow-up webinar as well, our, our learning objectives are to help you identify the four key domains of the spirit of motivational interviewing, and that's also sometimes referred to as the style of motivational interviewing, just sort of our way of being and our main approach to other people when we're doing motivational interviewing, um, and help you employ those core skills of motivational interviewing at a basic level, and also, you know, to get you the opportunity to apply at least one strategy. We're going to go over a number of them um, throughout the learning series, but hopefully you'll have at least one strategy that feels like a real take-home strategy for you that you want to go and um, try to apply it with the folks you work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we're also, because we recognize that um, motivational learning is not something that we can just learn in a little one-shot uh, deal here, um, we're going to help you think about some next steps for you in terms of your future development should you decide that motivational interviewing is something that you want to move forward with and continue to work toward proficiency in. So today on this webinar, we're going to go over a little bit of the background of the evidence 
of motivational interviewing, why do we say that it's an evidence-based approach, and what, what do we know from the research. We're going to talk a little bit about the worldview of motivational interviewing, and then that leads us directly into the spirit or the style of motivational interviewing. So that's what we hope to accomplish on our call today. Just a little bit about me. Thank you for the introduction, Ashley. Um, I've been using motivational interviewing, um, gosh, for almost 10 years now, and my first introduction to it was um, in the primary care setting where I was having conversations with folks about alcohol, substance use, diet, exercise, um, and other components of a healthy lifestyle um, using a motivational interviewing approach when they came to their primary care um, office for a visit. Um, and I've been training it and coaching it uh, for a few years less than I've been using it. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work with professionals in a wide variety of different settings. Um, I am a member of the Motivation Interviewing Network of Trainers. Just a little background on that. That is a organization devoted to promoting, you know, quality research and training in motivational interviewing. Uh, trainers in motivational interviewing do not have to belong to that organization. Um, it's not a license to train in any way, but um, it is, if you're looking for someone who can help guide you in motivational interviewing, that's one of several indicators that you could look for um, that someone is, you know, interested in staying abreast in the latest news and motivation and reading the latest research and working with a large community. There's over a thousand members and it's an international organization. So working with a large community of peers who are also working on training. Um, it's a great resource to me um, as a trainer because I know that there's a lot of other MI trainers who have my back, so to speak, when I encounter a question. So, um, We've been talking for a few minutes now about this motivational interviewing thing, and I haven't even defined it for you yet. So to get us all on the same page, uh, one definition or one way of, of saying what motivational interviewing is is listed on this slide. So MI is a collaborative, person-centered guiding method, and it's specifically designed to elicit and strengthen motivation, um, and particularly motivation for change, but in general motivation. Um, so this helps us think about when might it be applicable. So there are some circumstances where MI is not an issue, um, might not be the tool in your toolkit that you want to pull out. One of those um, easy deciding points is, is motivation a factor in what I'm working with this particular patient on? If, motivational, if motivation is a factor, then that's one indicator that motivation interviewing might be a, an applicable tool for you. There's a lot of concepts packed in that one definition, and hopefully we'll, um, we'll go through them. It's a pretty jargony definition. Another definition that I like is um, it's just a way of structuring our conversations, right? So it's a way, it's a framework. Um, that's one of the things I most appreciate um, about motivational learning is it provides me with a little bit of a strategic framework for how to structure my, my chats with people. Um, and the goal in motivational interviewing is to help the other person really hear themselves talking about and making their own arguments for the change or their own arguments for the health behavior. Um, so rather than what we traditionally are, is us as the professionals making those arguments for why a person should take their medication or follow the prescribed diet or follow the treatment plan that we're recommending. Um, in motivation, we flip the script a little bit, and we try to give them opportunities to make those arguments themselves. So we, we say that it's guiding, um, it's a guiding method, and there are some times um, in our healthcare conversations where we really are directing, um, where we're giving instruction, sharing education, those kinds of things. That's much more of a directing style. And um, there, then there are times when we're going to want to really be in that following stance where the other person is completely taking the lead and we're just there um, in a supportive capacity. 
and I sort of situates itself in the middle of those, and we have to be a little bit flexible um, and be able to sort of shift our approach as the situation and the person in front of us changes. Um, but that guiding approach is really where we're not telling the other person what to do, but we are providing some structure and some guidance um, for them. So that, that sort of middle way between just telling them and just listening to them. When we think about um, learning and teaching motivational interviewing, there are two main aspects. There's the relational aspects of motivational interviewing. So that includes sort of our style and our worldview and our approach, um, what MRI folks call the spirit of MRI. And then there's the technical aspects, which are, um, you know, our particular skill set that we focus on and some of the particular strategies in motivational interviewing. We're going to focus on this call primarily on the relational aspects. And um, in the webinar, we're going to look at putting the two pieces together. But one thing I do want to point out is that there's a whole lot in MI that's not unique to MI. So as we shift into talking a little bit about the worldview and the style and the spirit of MI, you're going to, I hope, I hope and I know from experience that you will recognize a lot of the components of the spirit of MI as things that you already do, things that are already incorporated into your worldview, whether you know anything about motivational interviewing um, or not. And the same is true with the technical aspects. There are quite a bit um, in the skills that we work on in MI that um, hold true across other styles of communication as well. Where MI sort of becomes uniquely motivational interviewing is the, the strategy behind it and the way that we intersect those skills with that style or spirit approach. So a little bit of background of motivational interviewing. Um, we're currently, if you were looking for one main resource or one source for motivational interviewing, this would be the book to go to, Motivational Interviewing, Helping People Change. Uh, the two authors of that book are generally considered the the architects or the fathers of motivational interviewing. Um, William Miller is a psychologist of the University of New Mexico, and Stephen Wolnick is also a health psychologist um, from Wales. Uh, he grew up in South Africa, but has um, spent most of his adult professional life in Wales um, or in, and England. Um, and so they got together um, first in uh, 91 and wrote this little book, Motivation Doing, Helping People Change. And traditionally, for a long time, that was the main way that motivation interviewing um, was spread. The main way people learned motivation interviewing was by picking up the book and reading it. Um, about 10 years later, they issued a second edition, and now thir um, 30 years after the first edition, so in 2011, the third edition was published. Um, in the third edition of the book, there's over uh, 25,000 articles that are citing motivational interviewing, and it contains the findings um, of over 200 randomized control trials. Um, in this third edition, there were some fairly significant additions and, and deletions and some changes to what was contained previously in the second edition. So for folks who've had um, past training in MI, I like to point that out because a lot of times there are some things that people think, hey, wait, why, did, why are you not teaching us about this? Or um, I learned about this. Why? What about that? Um, there are some things that the research has told us we should focus more on and some things that the research is suggesting we really should um, – move our focus away from in motivational interviewing. So this field is still very much being driven by what the research says, and um, it's also, you know, 30 years young, so we're still learning um, and adapting as we go. So this slide um, really illustrates how um, motivational interviewing has spread into a number of disciplines, and it also gives us a little bit of that historical perspective. So the first um, research in motivational interviewing was published um, in the late 80s, 
was conducted throughout the mid eighties and published in the late eighties as those as those things happen. Um so right here in our um first little bar graph, um we've got six studies that were published and they were all in the area of alcohol and other drug treatments. Um, so that's where motivation was sort of first conceived of and um, first researched. As you can see quickly in that next little time blurb, so 95 to 99, we get a lot more color in our bar graph there, um, which indicates that motivation was spreading far beyond just the alcohol and drug, other drug treatment world. Um, so you'll see we um, started spreading to, um, you know, people with dual diagnosis, problem gamblers, offenders. That talks about the criminal justice population. Um, I don't like that's a particularly pejorative term for it, but that, that's who they're talking about there. Um, eating disorders, treatment adherence and retention in general, I think we go all the way up to, like, family here in that first little bit. So what happened in the research world was, um, you know, people looked and said, gosh, you know, patients with that alcohol and other drug treatment um, component, we know that they're traditionally very challenging patients. It's a hard population to work with, a hard population to see change, and the research is really promising. So if it would work on that population, I want to see if it would work with the population that I work with. So we started to see quite a bit of applications to other things. In, you know, 95 to 99 is when we saw the first research around cardiac issues and diabetes, which is what we're focusing on. Um, so the research is not brand new on here, um, but we um, we continue to grow. So as you look, as you can see in the subsequent um, bar graphs there, um, in each time period, we have more and more studies coming out, looking in um, quite a diverse uh, field of applications for motivational interviewing. Um, the slide, as you might notice, stops at 2009. Um, a colleague of mine created the slide and kindly of lent it to me, but I, I don't have the <laughs> the skills to update it. But if it was updated, you would see we're up to a number of over 200 now. And, you know, some of the cutting edge um, applications that we're seeing, you know, obesity, which is the most recent one on this list, tends to be a, continue to be a hot topic, particularly pediatric obesity. Um, and we're seeing a large volume of research um, on motivation during with youth um, in various settings as well. So, um, that's just sort of a, a brief crash course in um, the studies around motivational interviewing. If there's a particular topic that you're interested in or would like to see some of the research in, um, on the last slide today, you'll have my contact information. And please feel free to email me and say, hey, I'd be interested in seeing the research um, or at least, you know, a study or two on MI and this. And um, if I can locate it and get my hands on it, I will bring it um, to the live workshop if you uh, let me know of your interest. So I'm a little bit of a pragmatist, so I'm like, yay, you have a lot of studies. We've done a lot of research on MI. Bottom line it for me, what do we know? So what holds true across, you know, the majority of the research is that motivational interviewing improves our retention, so how long someone stays in a program or with a particular treatment plan, it improves adherence, uh, and it improves outcomes across a wide range of behaviors. We also know that motivation in generalizes fairly well across cultures. We do need to do some cultural adaptation if you're working, um, you know, with a culture that's vastly different um, than yours, but that's, and that's true of not just MI, but you know, most evidence-based practices. Um, we also, some of the research on that surprisingly tells us that when a professional is working with a traditionally disadvantaged culture, the effect sizes tend to be even though slightly larger when we use motivational reviewing. And some of the theory, the um, thinking behind why that would be true is just that motivational reviewing really pays particular attention to issues of power and control in relationships. And so when you're working with a traditionally marginalized 
um, population, um, just having a framework to pay attention to that um, and partner around that as opposed to sort of ignoring that um, seems to be useful in motivational interviewing. We also know, um, and this again is not just true to motivational interviewing, but that relationship matters. And that's true whether it's, um, you know, a long-term, many years um, relationship or whether it's a short, you know, um, brief intervention kind of context of a relationship. So I think I mentioned the first um, instance where I was exposed to and was um, using motivational interviewing was in primary care, um, having these healthy lifestyle conversations with patients. Um, most of my interactions with people were 15 minutes or less, and usually it was I would visit them once. Um, I had some follow-up, some patients who, you know, really decided they wanted to make changes and stuck with um, following up with me. But for the majority of patients, it was one conversation um, that lasted 15 minutes or less. And what we know is that relationship, even in the context of a conversation like that, can be vitally important. We also know that change talk, sustained talk, and discord really matter. Those are three concepts that we'll introduce a little bit later, but the good news is that to a large degree, how much and what quality of those things we get is in our control. Um, so we can predictively do things that trigger or invite um, change talk or sustained talk into our conversation, and we can particularly do things that sort of shut it down. Um, so that's um, a positive and empowering thing about motivational interviewing for me. Um, we also know that motivational interviewing is learnable, which is a relief for me um, as someone who tries to support other people in their learning of it. Um, it's not something you're either inclined to or not inclined to or born doing or not born doing. It's something that we can um, pretty reliably learn and we know um, what things best support um, people in their learning. And we also know that we can reliably measure proficiency. So we can look at someone's conversations and assess how proficient their use of motivational interviewing is, uh, which is good, and which is even better. The second part of that, um, which to me is the main point, which is that higher levels of proficiency predict better patient outcomes. So we can take a look at how you as a health professional are using MI, and we could make some guesses about the outcomes of your patients based on that. So a couple meta-analyses um, to share with you, and then we'll sort of pivot off of the boring research stuff. Um, at least boring from my estimation. If this is your cup of tea, let me know, and I'll send you quite a bit more. Um, but does MI work? So a meta-analysis from 2010 done by uh, Brad Lundahl and his colleagues found that about in about 75% of the cases that they looked at trials of motivational interviewing, the patients who received, the patients or clients who received motivational interviewing showed improvement. So um, the first point from there, my first takeaway is that, yes, it works, and it doesn't work with everybody. So it's not... Um, a miracle cure that's going to all of a sudden have everyone making these dramatic changes. The other um, point about that 75% is that, you know, 50% of that was a small but meaningful effect. So people did make changes. They made small changes, statistically significant changes, and they were meaningful changes, but they were considered small. And then about 25% um, gained a moderate or strong level of effect that was also, you know, statistically significant and um, meaningful in their lives. So um, one of the things about motivational interviewing is that um, for some patients, it really will be um, a visible, drastic turnaround. And so for some patients, it's more of a gradual shifting. And so um, I think that's important to manage expectations up front. But we do know that um, in studies where they used motivation, about 75% of people found that it uh, led them to some improvement. 
So how does it work? Um, you know, what are the main kinds of things that we're focusing on? We work on reducing resistance. And, you know, on a couple different levels. So we work to reduce the person's resistance to change in general or to the behavior. And we also work on that interpersonal resistance, which um, in our MI language we call discord. So that's really where they're pushing back more against us as the provider or the healthcare professional than pushing back against the change. And so we work to differentiate those two because they call for a slightly different response. But most importantly, we proactively work to establish our relationships in a way that's going to invite less of that resistance in the first place. We also very um, intentionally and specifically address ambivalence. Ambivalence is a huge concept in motivational interviewing, and it really just talks about that um, that experience of feeling both ways about something. I know I really should quit smoking, but it's going to be too hard. I'd like to eat more healthy, but I have such a sweet tooth. I know I've got to take my pills, but I don't like the side effects. So generally, we hear ambivalence when there's kind of a but involved, and um, that's our, our our auditory clue that there might be some ambivalence there. Um, but ambivalence is where people really can and often do get stuck in the change process because both of those things feel true and important to the other person. So motivational interviewing has some, has some approaches to really specifically address that as opposed to just um, – leaving it there or trying to sweep it under the rug and move forward without resolving that ambivalence. Because if the ambivalence is not resolved, at least to some degree, um, people are going to have a hard time getting completely bought in to making a change. We also work in motivational interviewing to raise discrepancy. And what that means is the difference between where someone is in their life, um, what their life is currently like, and where they want to be, or where they, how they'd like their life to be structured and set up. So we can raise that discrepancy by, um, you know, asking questions that invite them to look forward um, if they make a change or don't make a change. Um, and we can raise discrepancy by sharing information. There's lots of different ways that we can raise discrepancy. The important thing is that the discrepancy creates a little bit of discomfort. And we want that discomfort to be, you know, small enough that it's not completely painful and something that people run away from, but also significant enough that it's something that might invite them to consider a change or a behavior that they haven't considered before. Uh, and then the fourth thing that really is important strategically in how MI has an impact on our, our conversations is this concept of change talk. So we work really hard to draw change talk out of other people. And change talk is um, loosely sort of defined as the other person's arguments for change. So their whole, their reasons for why they might want to make a change, why they should make a change, what, how they might be able to make a change, all of that. And we work to um, really focus other people on telling us about those things, hearing themselves talking about those things, and some of the research, some of the um, – Psycholinguistic research that has been done in motivational learning, and this is sort of the newest emerging thing, really shows the power of that change talk and how that can really impact outcomes for patients if they're given an opportunity to identify and strengthen and hear themselves uh, giving voice to those things. So we really work hard at that in motivational learning. And so we hear change talk in two main categories, importance and confidence. So, um, and this, you know, talks a little bit back to, or shows back to the ambivalence concept as well. So importance, if we have high importance and low confidence, we might hear things like, you know, I'd really like to, but I'm not sure I can, 
or I know I should, but it's going to be too hard, right? So that's sort of our A condition where people have high importance and low confidence. We also see high confidence sometimes and low importance. Um, I could do it, but I just don't think there's a good reason to. Um, we hear that a lot with our adolescent patients. We hear that a lot with, uh, for example, patients using uh, marijuana, right? I, I could stop at any time, but I just don't see any reason to. Um, a lot of the teenage cigarette smokers that I work with, this is exactly what I hear. You know, yeah, I can quit at any time, but I just, now is not the time for me. It's not a priority. It's not important. Um, we love, so that's condition B. Um, condition C are those patients that we love, right? The patients we might not even super need to use a ton of motivational interviewing with, but they're the ones who show up kind of ready, able, and willing. You know, I know this is important, and I know I can do it if I put my mind to it, and I'm ready to go. Um, unfortunately, at least in my experience, those are few and far between, and um What's not addressed is those patients in the, what I guess would be the D condition, where there's low importance and low confidence. Those would be the folks sort of hiding out right down here, where I'm not sure I have a reason to, and I probably couldn't do it anyway, even if I tried. Um, so motivational interviewing can help us um, address all four of those situations to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to help them identify sources of their own motivation to uh, increase both their importance and their confidence in making changes. Motivational interviewing is often um, introduced and thought of in the same breath as the stages, stages of change theory. Um, they're not the same conceptually. They're not, um, and they're not, they don't, necessarily suggest that you do the same things, but they are uh, sort of commonly referred to as maybe kissing cousins. They were the first paper on motivational interviewing and the first paper on uh, the trans theoretical model of change or the stages of change theory were introduced at the same um, conference, and they sort of grew up together, um, and there is a lot that um, one can benefit from the other. Uh, the stages of change has a little more of a formality to it in terms of the various stages and in terms of how you respond based on your assessment of what stage the person's in. But I think it's useful, even from an MI approach, to just be familiar that with the idea that patients do cycle through these various stages as they're um, thinking about making a change. So the first one is this pre-contemplation. That's where they're sitting pretty comfortable, um, don't have a lot of um, rationale built up to make a change, um, maybe don't even have a lot of awareness that a change would be necessary. Um, so, and then... Um, on this uh, picture, they, they mention a point of recognition, right, where they start to have an inkling that something needs to change. And um, some people stay there for quite a while. Some people progress pretty quickly into the contemplation phase, which is really where ambivalence is um, a key factor. So they're thinking about it sort of alternating maybe between thinking about it and then trying not to think about it. Um, but that's where, you know, the change is sort of on their mind, but they're not actively doing anything about it. Uh, the next one is preparation, where they're starting to get ready for a change, but they haven't, you know, again, still have not yet taken action. Maybe they've decided on when they'll make the change and started talking to people about it or making some arrangements, depending on what the change might be, um, but they haven't uh, jumped in yet. Um, so for people who are making, trying to make changes in their diet, you know, they might be, like, cleaning all their cupboards out of the, you know, cleaning all the junk food out of their cupboards, making a healthy food shopping list, researching menus, those kinds of things. Then the next phase is action, and that's, um, pretty self-explanatory, that's where they're actively working on the change, right? So, again, in the example of healthy eating, that might be where they're on their diet, right? They're um, eating healthy, cooking healthy, 
uh, doing all of those things that we'd like to see. And then the last phase, which can last um, for, you know, a variable amount of time for some people, they consider that it lasts for the rest of their life, um, is maintenance. And so that's where they're just doing whatever they need to do to keep that change intact. The other thing that might not be entirely visible on this image for you, but is that all of the stages of change have sort of on-ramps and off-ramps. So we know that um, recurrence with any type of behavior change is the rule rather than the exception. And we know that once people have successfully made a change, a great deal of them go back to the previous behavior at some point in their life. Something happens and they, you know, fall off the wagon or, you know, get out of their habit of exercising, whatever it may be. Um, we have lots of ways of talking about this in our in our common language. But, you know, we know that that's, that's the rule rather than the exception. The rarity is when that doesn't happen for people, when they just make a change and never look back. Um, so it's useful from an MI point of view to have this awareness and to really be able to listen to the person in front of you and make some assessment about where they might be um, in this process and adjust, we can adjust our strategies and our approach accordingly. I find that hopefully throughout the conversation I'm having with the people, they're progressing through several different stages um, just as we talk, um, but that may or may not be the case for everyone. So we're going to talk a little bit about the worldview um, in motivational interviewing. And before we talk about what the MI worldview is, we'll talk about the traditional worldview. So in our traditional helping professions, we have what has been referred to as the deficit approach. Uh, which sounds a little pejorative, quite frankly. I don't know, it sounds like they're out there being mean as helpers, and that's, that's not the case at all. But it just talks about what we're focusing on. So we focus a lot on what's wrong. We identify the problem, um, and we try to get at why is that problem there. Um, so, you know, what's the matter with this person that they haven't made the change? Um, maybe they don't know that they should be uh, eating healthy. Maybe they don't understand the um, diet expectation that their provider, you know, prescribed for them. Maybe they don't know how. Maybe they don't understand how to count carbs um, or how to calculate their insulin as a result of that. Maybe they just don't care. You know, they've just given up. It's too hard. They don't care. Or maybe they're in denial and they don't um, understand um, or they don't want to understand how to take care of themselves because they don't even want to admit that they have, you know, diabetes, which is just this feels like a life sentence to them. So if we're making those kinds of assumptions about why the behavior is or isn't happening, then that prescribes a particular role for us as the helper. We might want to educate them, inform them. We definitely do a lot of persuading where we're trying to convince them that, that there is a problem, convince them that they should be um, following these uh, recommendations. Um, and we're, we're generally trying to provide what's missing. Right? So metaphorically, um, when I think about the deficit approach, I think about um, the glass, which is half empty, and we're focusing on the empty part. And then that tells us that our role as the helper is to be the faucet and try to fill it, fill up that glass. Because we need the water to get over the lid of the, over the tip of the glass, over the lid, um, over the rim, I guess I should say. And um, so in order to do that, in order to make that happen, get the patient over that hurdle, we're just going to fill it up. And I don't know about you, but I've certainly been in the situation where I feel like I'm a faucet and I'm flowing at full force and gosh darn it, that glass must have a hole in the bottom or something because it is not filling up. Um, the deficit approach can be frustrating. It can also feel really good. It, it feels like I have the answers, I can provide what you need, let me give you this education, let me um, give you a talking to, let me provide what's missing, and then now I've cured them. We generally all go into the helping professions because we want to make people's lives better, 
And it's hard when we feel like we have what's missing. It's hard to not just offer that to the other person. Um, we call that the writing reflex. When we see something wrong, we want to set it right. And um, it's very strong um, personality-wise in people who are drawn to helping professions like the medical field. Um, we didn't get in this um, for the fame and glory. We generally got in it because we wanted to make people's lives better and help people. Um, so it's hard sometimes to step outside of this deficit approach because um, while it can be frustrating, it can also feel pretty darn good sometimes. So am I, though, invites us to try a different way. Um, and this shares a lot in common with what we often call the strength-based approaches, right? So rather than focusing on what's wrong or what's missing, the competence approach uh, focuses on what matters to the other person, what's important, what are their strengths, what are their values, what resources are they bringing to the situation, what are their perspectives and experiences, and then that suggests a vastly different role for us as the helper. We are there to listen. We aim to understand their circumstances, their context, their situation, and their perspective. We want to be identifying and reflecting themes and asking some good, stimulating questions to help structure things to move along. So metaphorically, in that competence approach, um, as the glass is still not full up to the top, um, but our strategy for getting the water over the edge is completely different. Instead of being the faucet and trying to provide what's missing, we're aiming to be the straw. So we're just trying to draw up what's already there. Whatever that person walks in the room with, that's what we're going to try and use um, to help the situation. And we're just pro providing sort of a little bit of friction maybe and a little bit of a structure to get, get them over that hump of change. So which leads us directly into sort of the MI worldview, which is that people are competent. We, they have this self-knowledge, attitudes, capabilities that can be really useful um, in the change process. And so our main focus is on being present with them in a way that's going to support that change. The four main elements of the spirit of MI aim to all support that uh, way of being um, present with the other person in a supportive way. And we'll look at all four of them very briefly, and then we'll end for, for today and um, look to uh, addressing some questions that you may have. So the first is partnership, and we're going to go much more in-depth in our um, in-person workshop, but you know, partnership is really about dancing with the other person um, versus wrestling. So that's a good sort of litmus test, a good finger to the wind. If it feels like I'm dancing with this person, maybe we get out of step every once in a while, but generally it feels like we're dancing. Um, it's a good indication that you've got some good partnership going on. It feels like you're wrestling with them at every turn. It might be an idea to uh, focus in on that partnership element a little more. Evocation is our second main component of the spirit of motivational engineering, and that really talks about evocation just means drawing out from the other person. So we want our style to be much more curious and compassionately curious than anything else. So we want to hear the person's story and not just focus exclusively on checking any box here or there. Um, acceptance is about really accepting the other person's autonomy reminding them explicitly that any decisions that are made are up to them, as opposed to a much more sort of um, constraining autonomy, you have to do this, you need to do this, this is important for your health um, kind of approach. What we find is that paradoxically when we stress that the other person is in control and when we focus on their choices, they're much more willing to be engaged in considering um, some of the healthy choices that we want them to be making. And um, then there's compassion, which is um, an explicitly named element of the spirit of motivational reading, and that's new to this third edition of the book that uh, 
Dr. Miller and Romick decided they needed to expressly name that, partly because we are starting to see a little bit of uh, creep in here in terms of um, sales and other things um, wanting to use the MI approach because of how powerful it is. And so there's sort of a little position statement issued by them that says we develop MI for use by people like those in the helping profession whose primary focus is on the well-being of the client or patient. It's never to be used with the intention of selling products or getting to do something that benefits the provider, which we've explicitly described as unethical practice. A cornerstone of the MI spirit is compassion, whereby the patient's well-being is our prime directive and the reasons for our consultations. The best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. So, really, we want to do MI not to talk people into doing something that they wouldn't want to do in the first place, but really to help them um, act in their own best interest. And then it's not explicitly named, but underpinning all of the elements of the spirit of MI is empathy. And we talk a lot and focus a lot on the concept of empathy and motivational interviewing. It's really where we listen with the intent to understand. Um, empathy is not the same as sympathy, which is feeling the same as them, or it's not having had the same experiences or the same struggles. Um, and it's certainly not pity or feeling sorry for the other person. But empathy is about sort of actively listening and trying to understand their perspective. So we'll go through this um, in a little more depth um, in our live workshop. But these are the four processes that can structure our work in MI. Um, engaging, oh, and so, you know, they somewhat go in the order that they're written. Um, but we may circle back around to one or the other. Um, engaging is really about establishing that working relationship with the other person. And it's been suggested that we want to spend about 20% of our of our time, the first 20% of our time, with someone um, exclusively uh, focusing our energies on engaging. So if we have 10 minutes to meet with the person, that's uh, the first two minutes. We should really only be focusing on engaging. And not that um, after two minutes we drop that, but that should be our primary focus for the first two minutes. Likewise, if we had 100 minutes, right, we would want to spend our first 20 on engaging. The next uh, of the four processes is focusing, and that's really where we just develop and maintain a specific agenda. Um, it be very clear from the outset of our visit, or it might be something that we need to um, focus our effort on um, partnering with the other person to decide on what our focus is going to be for our time together. The fourth, the third of the four processes is evoking, and that's where we really specifically hone in on that change talk idea and work to draw it out from the other person. That's where we employ quite a bit of the skills and strategies that we're going to work on in, the work, in our workshop time to draw out and consolidate and strengthen the change talk that the other person has brought to the encounter. And again, as a reminder, change talk is just any speech that favors a movement toward the change or the positive behavior, and it's the other person's own arguments for change, not our own. And then the last of the four processes, which we don't even always get to in motivational interviewing, is planning. So we know how to plan. We very effectively come up with lots of plans for our patients. What's unique about planning and motivational interviewing is that we make sure that it's part of that collaborative process and is done in a partnering way where we're continuing to be the straw and not the faucet um, and draw out ideas and strategies from the other person, supplementing it where we might need to, but most um, mostly focusing on the ideas and the plan that the other person brings to the equation. So we have about eight minutes left on our time, and we'll take uh, questions and comments in just a minute. I don't, I didn't notice any appearing in the chat box. If you have some and you don't want to be unmuted, feel free to put it in the chat box at this time as well. Um, the other thing, in addition to questions, that I would love to hear from you either by email, and you'll notice my email address is there, um, or on this call 
is if there are particular things, either patient scenarios or topics, that would be most useful for you, um, and by assumption, most useful for others in the group, um, for us to build into the workshop time next week. Um, I'd love to get that kind of feedback because really I could talk about any number of things and, and any guidance that you have about what feels most useful or interesting um, would help us make sure that it's the time you spend, um, which is your time is very valuable, I know, and the time you spend with us face-to-face is going to be as useful as possible. So feel free to um, let us know, you know, what we can do to make that time as, as effective as possible. Danielle, can you remind folks how to ask a question, please? Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star then one on your touch tone phone. If you wish to remove from the queue, please press the pound sign or the hash key. There will be a delay before the first question is announced. If you are using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star then one on your touch tone phone. Standing by for questions. Mia, looks like we have one in chat from Sarah Wright. Yeah, so Sarah is asking about um, what are the percentages of time needed to spend on evoking and focusing. Um, I shared that it's been suggested that we spend about 20% on engaging, but what about the others? We don't really have um, specific guidance on that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what some of the cues are for when we have um, enough change talk generated that we could shift out of evoking and into planning. Um, but in terms of focusing, that varies a lot just depending on the setting and the context and the topic. Um, so, for example, if you were in general counseling, right, it, um, focusing is going to be something you spend a lot of time with. If I work somewhere where, you know, over the door it says, stop smoking now clinic, it's pretty clear walking in what we're going to be focusing on. So there aren't um, really guidelines around how much time, but generally there are some behavioral cues, and I'm making a note now to make sure that we cover those in our workshop time about when we have enough, when we've heard enough and enough of the ambivalence has been resolved that we can shift out of evoking and maybe into planning. I know all you. your questions at this time. Okay, and I've got a few, I'm seeing a few other things in the, um, Ashley, there's a few questions about the um, handouts with the PowerPoint and the slides. I don't know if you want to address that, um, or I can. Uh, yeah, we'll, we will be distributing uh, PDF files of uh, Mia's presentations. I don't have a specific time on that, but I'll, um, we'll be sending those out to everyone very soon. Um, we do. We do have an audio question. This is yeah. this comes from William Gardner. Hey, Mia. Nice job. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. Okay, good. I really like the way you packaged it. So so different from uh, the way I presented it. I'm a more of a historical guy. I spent so much time talking about uh, Miller, Rolnick, and Carl Rogers. Uh, but I like. I really like the style. But my additional thing for next time is as a physician, and as you know, we are so time pressured, but you already did a good job of lessening the emphasis on reflective listening, which I think is the bugaboo for a lot of doctors. We don't feel like we're good at it, we weren't trained in it, and it's going to take a lot of time. But yet, you know, the dimension I'm sure will come up several times next week, but but I, I just want you to be aware of that, that from my perspective and when I talk to doctors, I always try to say, hey, you don't have to be uh, Mr. Reflective uh, Listener, but if you know what it is and it starts to come to you with a little bit of practice, you know, that, that might help. I, I really soft sell that. Um, but uh, excellent, excellent presentation so far. I'm so excited about next Thursday. 
Thank you. Thank you. And, yes, we, we definitely will spend some time um, developing our skillfulness around reflective listening. It's a key skill in motivational interviewing. Um, we can't abandon it completely because it really does help us get to where we need to get to. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to, um, at least for the folks who join us uh, live in Chula Vista next week, we'll be able to get you with some feeling of, a little bit of a feeling of mastery under your belt around reflective listening so that when it feels appropriate to use, you can, that's a tool you can pull out of your toolkit and have, have at the ready. Right. It's not the only thing we'll use. For right. Sure. Yes. It's scary. But, uh, but, uh, it I, is. It's a little bit different from how we're used to, used to communicating. Yes. But, that's for sure. All uh, right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the comment and the compliment. Um, so I'm just looking here. I see a few other, um, Scenarios in the chat, so how to interact when emotions run high, when the person's defensive, um, a young person who's giving really short answers, and we will address those scenarios in our uh, face-to-face time. And if you have anything else that you really would like um, to address in the face-to-face time, please feel free to shoot me an email, and if uh, my email's gone now, but if you don't have mine, you can send it to Ashley. Um, or any of the organizers of the conference, and they will get it to me. All right. Well, it looks like we are right at time, and we want to be uh, respectful of everyone's uh, ending lunch hour here. Thank you for joining us for lunch. Mia, thank you again for a a wonderful presentation, and I I know um, that everyone uh, like me is uh, excitedly looking forward to next Thursday. If any of you have questions about the workshop at Chula Vista, feel free to contact me. You should have that information already. Um, and with that, if you have just a minute or two to answer a couple of quick eval questions, we would certainly appreciate that. We'd love to get feedback from everyone. Uh, so we will conclude here. Thank you, Mia, once again, and say that we look forward to seeing all of you next Thursday. All right, come uh, prepare to interact. Yes. <laughs> All right, goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.